so this is a very special session. I consider this a masterclass on a uh, one of the media platforms called Out of Home. And uh, to deliver this topic, I couldn't think of a better person than somebody that actually I was her client when I was working in television and we were promoting one of our shows. That's how I met her. And that's one of the, um, you know, the, the, the great things about this industry is that a lot of the people that you meet, uh, they're very interesting, very dynamic because of the type of field that we're in. But ultimately, they become friends and part of your network. And thank God for Facebook, right, that we keep up with each other. So uh, I'm going to let Yvonne, um, you know, introduce herself. So Yvonne, I'm going to put you on view, uh, speaker view so that they see you, more of you. And, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christelle. And clockwise, I feel like we've become great friends throughout the years. And I love when you invite me to your classes and, and to do this type of educational with Out of Home. Um, I've been working with Clear Channel for pretty much 20 plus years. I won't be exact. I don't want any students trying to guess my age. But um, I've been doing this. I'm very passionate about it. I love it. Since day one, I feel like I've connected with this media source. Um, I didn't know anything about it when I first started working with Clear Channel back when it was known as Ackerley. And um, it just has become a very interesting type of product for me. And I love it. So I feel like that's why I've been here for so long. It's kind of in my blood. Um, but I'm going to go through each of these slides. Um, it has a little bit of information about all the different products and a little bit about how we measure impressions, traffic, demographic type of information. Um, and as I said, Griselle, if there's any questions or you need me to pause, let me know. But to get started, wanted to give you five of our most important um, statements that we try to get from our clients throughout a CNA. And a CNA is more like a client type of questionnaire just to find out exactly what the goals are, what they're trying to do, what they're advertising, if they're using any other medias, how does outdoor kind of come into the picture? And how we do this is we ask them, how can we help you tell your story? How can we target what demographic, what audience you're trying to target? How can we drive results to your business? and help you with your mobile, if you're doing any kind of digital work, and enhance it. Um, we like to make impact with Out of Home, as you can tell. Um, out of Home is one of those medias that no one can turn off. You're always tuned in. Is something that's very high visibility type of creative. So let's say you have a TV ad and you want to put something in out of home so that people can actually get a short message. Um, I always advise advertisers as large as this canvas is and it's the biggest size media that you can buy, less is more. You want to be bold, you want to be impactful. So to get your message across, always use simple words, simple language, um, something that's memorable so that the audience can remember. Um, visibility throughout the market, it depends on locations, on type of units. We have all types of sizes, which you'll see in the next few slides throughout the entire United States. What we try to convey to our advertisers is that out of home, it's not only an outdoor display, it's a journey. We try to target advertisers if they're walking, if they're flying into a market, if they're driving, um, whatever the situation may be, it might be a tourist in a market or it might be someone who lives in the market that you're trying to target. We focus on targeting all of those different medias and different 
roadways where we can actually get the commuters, the audience that you're trying to target. Clear Channel Outdoor, like I said before, has coverage throughout the entire United States, pretty much. We covered 28 of our largest DMAs throughout the United States. This is just a quick view of all the products. You'll see a key and it'll give you pretty much what all the products are within each market. Um, and the quick view key on the side that says the weekly reach is the percentage of the population that we can target within all of the markets together. This is what our footprint looks like. We have over 16,000 static bulletins. The static bulletins are the largest sized units that we can have along roadways. We have over 27,000 poster units, which um, are largely known for half the size of the bulletins. They're more on major surface streets, secondary arteries. In some markets, we have them on the highways, but not all of them. And then we have our bus benches, bus shelters. We have a lot of street furniture throughout different markets, and they all have a different look to them. So depending on what market you're looking at, you'll see a, a bit of a different look. Um, we also have spectaculars and walls like in New York, in LA, um, and we have about 15,000 plus of those. We also handle transits, railroads, buses throughout different markets, and we have about 25,000 plus of those. And we handle 20,000 plus displays within different airports throughout the United States. Our newest type of product that we've added to our footprint is digital. Not every DMA has digital displays, but we do have them in 26 DMAs of our markets. Within those DMAs, 16 are the top 20. And DMAs are the uh, designated market areas. And these are based on population. So they're ranked differently, just in case somebody needs to know what DMA is. Um, so we have over 16 DMAs that are within the top 20 that have digital inventory. Within the digital uh, displays are great. They're innovative, have been added to different markets and we consider them a premium product. And why I say a premium product is because pretty much I can say 99% of the locations are all A plus units or high demand areas with coverage that we didn't have before. The flexibility that the digital units allow are to change creative instantly they also have the capability of having a URL network added to the locations so that if you want to do these types of creatives where you have a content that has to constantly update, like a weather trigger, a time of day, um, if you're into sports and there's teams playing on a particular day and you want to keep the consumer updated with the scores, you can do that. Um, and you can actually end up with the winner at the end and change that instantly. Um, we have people that also um, tie in to their social media and allow for uh, folks to take a selfie. I don't know if you are all familiar with the Coke and the names on the Coke bottles. Um, we did a huge project um, with our wallscapes in New York and folks would take selfies and automatically it would display on our walls in New York as they were taking the selfies. So that was very cool. This is what we call a case study. I wanted to show basically what we do once a campaign goes up and they do something like with the digital units and they, uh, like for instance, this one was a Target 
campaign and they did a co-op and what they were hoping to do was to have folks actually buy the products or click into their website to find out about the products so when we did the triggers where they would change creative depending on the product and the time they saw an increase of three percent that went into the stores to support what they were advertising or the consumer went in to buy something that was on the ads that were part of the out of home with the triggers we also have a very exciting capability to do with our digitals which is saturate and do a roadblock is what we call it and this roadblock what it does is we add we have the advertiser add up for five minutes six times during the day for a total of 30 minutes on every single digital board we have throughout the United States. Or if they just wanted to do one market, they could. But it gives the advertiser the, the option to have 100% share of voice, meaning they have the entire digital display for themselves. The average is eight advertisers, eight seconds each. So what happens is they rotate every eight seconds to new advertisers throughout the day. So if they did the roadblock, they would have a total of five minutes, six times a day to take over the digitals. We had Earthlink go ahead and do this program in Atlanta, and it was very successful. They actually had a publication to show that they did this for the day. So the client was able to see the roadblock as their headquarters was opening up and doing the ribbon cutting at the office in Atlanta. Wanted to also give you a, a little show of what other areas we cover. We have the European markets, we have Spain, Italy, France, where we have different type of out of home displays. And we also carry displays in the LATAM and the Asia markets. This just gives you an overview of what products we have within those market areas and how we can cover them. Now I'm gonna go into a little bit of how we deliver the impressions on our out of home. We used to have what we call Traffic Audit Bureau. That has since changed between 2019 and 2020. It changed over to what we call GeoPath. We still have the traditional advertisers that request a specific location based on proximity to their business or proximity to competitors, or if they just wanna target a specific zip code for a particular reason um, but with now with geopath in addition to that we can actually show them how they can target specific demographics like if you have someone that wants to target the hispanic areas a particular age group a particular household income of a hundred thousand a year we can do that based on data that we collect from census data that's collected through OAAA, which is our Out of Home of America advertising agency. Um, they work hand in hand with TAB and now Geopath to deliver those data numbers to us based on our locations. So what they do is they go location by location and they geofence them to find those particular demographics and how the board is based on how many Hispanics are there, what the population is within the certain demographic area there, within the board's location. As a caveat, we've come up with our own program that's called RADAR. And this is 
a little bit more targeted than GeoPath because this will also create a, a, a layer on top of that that will show you the behavioral type of uh, demographic that will go into different uh, retail stores, um, quick service restaurant, hotels, um, anywhere that people will click into on their mobile devices, that will pick up that data and tell us where they visited, what they're interested in, um, age groups that, you know, visit Wendy's, things like that. So we've added that to the GeoPath numbers so that we can even target even more in depth into what the locations will, uh, will target, what audiences. This gives you a little glimpse of what we just explained about GeoPath and TAB. TAB was pretty much, uh, to give you a little bit of background, TAB would actually sit next to a roadway, let's say the Palmetto Expressway, and count the drivers that would drive by a billboard and tell us what was the traffic count of that expressway. So that was the impressions that we would give an agency. Well, now with GeoPath, they actually get that traffic count plus data that tells them who's driving by the boards so that that way we can target their specific audience, uh, demographic, or any age group that they need us to target. Here's a little block of how they're broken up and what data they collect. They do the mobile device trip data. They also have the census. So that's why it's so important to please fill out your census information. It just gives everyone a good sense of where people live, how many people live in a household, what are the age groups, so that we can better target those areas with a needed assistance or with our media. And I'm just gonna go a little bit over, a little bit more of what Radar um, actually can give you and what are the capabilities. Radar View is actually the system that we use. We have all of our inventory into the system. And what we do is we have all of the audiences also in the system. The data that is pulled is from a third party and from the census as well. What radar does is it captures the traffic that's heading towards the board within a radius and it'll give us what mobile devices are clicking into different um, stores, different um, questions, anything that's going on that people are researching or anything like that, that's what is captured in our data. Another device or another program that we have or another tool is Radar Connect. And this comes together with the mobile device. I'm gonna give you a sample of an advertiser who did billboard advertising and tied into the mobile connect to their advertising with the out of home. Sedanos. Sedanos did billboard digital campaign in Miami and they connected the mobile devices to the digital. And what it does is it will send out the banners with their advertising and serve people that are within a mile radius of the billboard. So we geofence every billboard, or if the client wanted in this case, what they wanted to do was to geofence all the Sedano supermarkets and have ads served to those folks that were within that geofence of the 2.5 mile radius of their store locations. In addition to that, we geofence competitors like Publix, Winn-Dixie, Presidente supermarkets, along with their own stores, and also served the ads to those individuals within that mile radius. 
The ads that are served are different sizes. There's banners and there's one that will come across the screen and give them an update of any specials or any creative that you feel would be eye-catching to whomever is within that vicinity of the area that we're geofencing. Here's a case study from Boston Market who did a program similar to that as well. They geofenced their store locations. They wanted to build the awareness of stop cooking during the holidays in Thanksgiving time. And what they did was they did the same. They did out of home. They did the billboards, transit shelters, and the mobile. The ads were served. At the end of the campaign, they noticed that six times as many um, audience or community or people from the community went into their store locations and they click through their ads in the system. This created for them to extend their program and do one more campaign during December and for Christmas. So they saw results. The last tool that we have is our radar proof. And what this does is an attribution study. It will show the client what were the results, what happened, what came out of their out of home, their mobile, their entire program together. We go ahead and identify what units, what was the products used. Then we take what actions were taken by the consumer. We take that data and we put it together and we show them who was exposed and who wasn't. And then we show them how the awareness was increased or how their store visits were increased or whatever the goal was, if there was to go into their website or to see more of the products, you know, off the shelves, whatever the case was, they, this is what the radar proof will show them. Now, one thing I wanted to make sure everyone understands is that with out of home, less is more as we started from the beginning, eye-catching advertising, anything that's out of the box will make it the most memorable ad you can do. If you don't remember an ad, it, it didn't work. You need to revise your creative or change up your locations. Um, we need to adjust. And this is another great uh, example of out of home to make it relevant. This is memorable. Um, I, I think everyone knows about the, cow, the cows and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and you can always think out of the box. Nothing is too big for the billboard. Um, we can always change things around add extensions, um, we can get very creative when it comes to billboards. And I just wanted to show something a little familiar. One of our wonderful partners, FIU. And that is my presentation. Any questions, Griselle, or anything you'd like me to add or go well, back you, over? No, this was awesome. Uh, yeah, the, the industry has changed quite a bit, um, you know, especially uh, with with all the technology, you know, that, that has been added that is possible. Uh, really mind-blowing because uh, you have this notion that out of home is this billboard, but all the different extensions that you can do as a marketing and advertising campaign with the geofencing and adding the social element, you know, it makes it far more dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it cuts through the clutter. And, and I do agree, actually, uh, one of the billboards, I think that when you and I met uh, was one of those extensions where yeah. the talent, I don't know if you remember, because it was like trying to, trying to make that bald head stick out, you know. know. Of the you know the confines of the space uh, was fun and it was actually a very fun conversation too you know but yeah I I do have um, some questions um, and it it um, revolves 
around digital digital billboards versus mm -hmm. static billboards uh, because yeah the the digital billboards have so many different types of uses yes. and uh, the one that that i recall the most is for example hospitals and their waiting time oh, you know, yeah. so that, that you're able to incorporate that and update it as you were saying in real time mm -hmm. and scores and all that uh, so that's really eye-catching uh, the other element of digital billboards is having, as you were mentioning, kind of almost like a commercial in yeah. rotation with other, you know, advertisers on the location. So uh, you may have covered this, um, but so how many advertisers are in the rotation and how long does the, uh, does the you know, ad stay on the surface before it rotates i would as an average because there there's some exceptions to this rule so just know that this is an average it's eight advertisers eight seconds each so let's suppose you buy one ad your rotation would come up every 64 seconds and you would stay on for eight seconds and then the next ad will come right after you. Um, I know that eight seconds sounds uh, short, but if you drive by a digital, take the time and just look so you'll see how they, it, it rotates. Um, you'll probably, if you're in normal traffic, you will get five to six spots that you will see and then you'll see the, you know, if you pass by, you'll probably see catch the next, you know, locate the next advertisers. But um, we've come up with an average that you'll see four to five advertisers on your drive with a regular like forty mile per hour type of traffic. Okay. okay. So uh, do you um, or maybe the advertiser have uh, done any study? that perhaps contrast brand recall with images and color, you know, in motion versus a static? Is that something that perhaps has been done as a point of reference? A study has not been done that I know of, but I can find out if there's any uh, article or anything that can help you with that question. But I do have to say, that with my time being in the out-of-home industry, it all depends on your client's goals um, and how the creative looks. It, I, I can't say it enough that if creative is too, too wordy or not as you know, eye-catching as it can be, you'll lose you'll lose a lot of eyes um and, and it doesn't matter if it's a static or a digital uh it has to be the color contrast is very important um we have a, a creative team here in-house and they constantly let us know please make sure contrast with colors um the the ads or samples that i show you are because they're great creative um i can show you terrible creative but i didn't want to <laughs> steer anybody that way but something like an fiu is just so well thought of because it, it gives you the message it's clear and it's to the point and it's a beautiful creative beautiful um and it's telling you it's online it's very it's talking to a consumer so that's when i see outdoor like this i very much appreciate it um, but when you see something that's getting very cluttered it's not going to work no matter what product you are on it's just not enough unless you're on a transit shelter where someone can actually sit and watch that you know and read it and take the time to you know just study it and and to, but when you're looking at out of home and you're in traffic you want something that's going to stand out capture and tell somebody the story quickly um and of and of course if you have something that runs four to eight weeks 
even better because people will start to memorize your message regardless. Yeah, no, that it's so true. Uh, because it's like the, the, the double take factor, right? That you, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, totally agree. And it can, they can be entertaining. So in a long, boring <laughs> drive, you know, to see, uh, you know, kind of like a change of pace. Exactly. Being great creative. And, and I think you and I appreciate it even more because we're in the industry. Uh, so I, I'm one of those people that do not skip commercials i watch commercials i Me analyze too. them i take them apart where somebody else would be watching something and if they have the capability of fast forwarding you know they exactly just, and um, tuning it out <laughs> exactly so so i have a question in re, in, in relations to measurement uh mm -hmm. because um we're very high on metrics and yes as you know um and actually you can uh take out the um, the presentation so that we can see your your face okay. a little clear okay um, so i yeah i wanted to talk um uh, a little bit about the the math associated with um with out of home uh because we all it, this is what i i uh i i tell students that the universal metric in this business is impressions and CPM. Um, but some uh, media has metrics that are specific to the medium. So mm -hmm. do you still uh, use the term showings? Uh, you know, do, do you still do that? Well, we've changed it a little bit um, just because of Geopath and all of this. Um, instead of gross rating points, which is how we used to have the showing levels and, and percentages of the population that we can target, we've now renamed it to target rating points because we're so targeted now and we're not so broad in the impressions that we were giving before with just traffic driving by or the opportunity to see the boards. Now we're actually calculating who is looking at the boards and who's driving by the boards. So we're calling it target rating points. And how we come up with that is a percentage of the population divided by whatever it is that you want to target. So it, it's, it's the same formula, but a little bit more specific to demographics. And I, yeah. can, I can send you little grids of exactly what the formulas are. It all depends on the product um, and on the timing that, that everybody wants to do. So yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and, and uh, yeah, we cover uh, GRPs versus TRPs and, and GRPs are more, like you say, generic, you know, like households versus people demographics so you right. you're honing down into something far more specific mm -hmm. which the whole industry is moving into something that is targeting you know specific right. people uh whether age gender or behavioral or you know mm -hmm. as, as you were mentioning you know that ability that geopath is allowing you know, and with the radar data is allowing to be even more specific to the target because, I mean, without a home, because it's uh, geolocated, you know, <laughs> exactly. you're targeting pretty much everyone. But if, everyone. if there's an area, you know, that you can target that is younger, hipper, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, technology, you know, uh, uh, or, or uh, you know, as you were saying, uh, zip codes that have a higher uh, per capita, you know, household uh, income uh, or what have you, you know, th this is the way to target. So, because, uh, you know, one thing that I say in my classes is that we are in the waste management industry, you know, and, and that's how it's, funny and weird but but it's true because every uh, every impression that is not that is delivered that is not necessarily part of the target could be wasted budget 
because exactly. you could you could have been targeting far more of those impressions mm -hmm. if you could have thought out you know the strategy for that particular medium a little yeah. bit tighter and you know so it's important so important when you're talking to clients always ask the question who are you targeting what is the goal because even if it's not just with out of home, with any media, I always recommend if you already have something, a media that you're using and it's working, great. Let's just give it a little bit of a boost with out of home. Let's try to add something else. In every case, out of home can fit in specifically to a demo, to a target. And like I said, it, you can never turn it off. So if you're missing them, that they're not at home, you're gonna catch them when they're out working, playing, whatever the case may be, taking kids to school, you know. So always think of media as a media mix. To me, is the best advice to any advertiser that calls me and say, are you doing anything else? Let me know because we could just, you know, piggyback on what you're doing if it's working. And if it's not, then maybe we can adjust and help that other media work along with out of home. So what are, you know, when, when you're out and you're in the sales world, um, what are some of the objections that you hear from clients that are like typical objections? Uh, and, and being in sales, you he hear them all, right? Yes. <laughs> so what are some of those that you hear and how do you combat them? How, how do you kind of work them out? I think the biggest one are because they see out of home as a large media, the first objection is you're too expensive or you're, you're going to take up too much of my time. Uh, it's too complicated. I don't understand it. Um, just, I don't, you know, I don't want to get into all of that. So for me, I always try to make it as simple as possible. Um, every presentation. This is one of the largest ones I've put together just to give you kind of a, an overview of everything, but I try to be as simple as I can and get as much information. I try not to be afraid to ask questions and try to get as much information as possible. So when I do deliver a proposal, it's talking to the advertiser as if okay, I, I understood what you need and here's the solution or here's what I recommend. Um, as soon as I do that, then they kind of like, oh, well, at least you were listening to me, <laughs> you know? So I think they, they appreciate that you listen and then they give you a little bit more attention and you can negotiate depending on their budget. You also need to know if it is a potential advertiser that you can follow through with, or if it's somebody that maybe you should recommend, okay, well, if you're doing what works, continue doing that. And when you have a higher budget for marketing, then give me a call and, you know, maybe we can work something out. But you need to know when to pursue and maybe even when to kind of let it go if it is somebody that's not a potential advertiser that would benefit from your media. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that that's, um, you know, kind of inherent in us, uh, you know, when, when you're selling, when it's a good prospect and, and when it's, uh, you know, time to cut them loose because of whatever reason, maybe they don't have the budget, maybe they're not ready, exactly. you know, and, and I was going to ask you, do you have, um, do you call client direct do you call on agencies or is it a combination well at this point at the position that i'm in i work with the national clients mm. so i import any business that comes from new york from chicago from any other market that's not south florida or tampa um, I handle both South Florida and Tampa markets. So I do do some client um, outreaches, but most of the business that I have is through agencies. So I work mainly with agencies, but I do do a little bit of client direct just to build the partnership, just to build the relationship on a local base. If somebody's based here in Miami, like I have a contact for Anheuser-Busch, for Heineken, for Carnival Cruise that are based here in Miami, I can speak to them. 
but the actual buy or the placing for any programs would come from New York or LA, depending on where their agency is based. So um, talking a little bit about the agency world and, and that type of negotiation, um, the media departments and the buying units for big clients used to be housed within the big full service agencies. How mm. have you seen that world change? It's changed quite a bit. I have to tell you, um, there's still a lot of competition through agencies, but clients do move around. So always try to keep a relationship direct with the client and with the agency. Um, we still have the big guys, you know, that take over most of the business, but I've seen uh, other buys like Hispanic buys or Hispanic divisions come from smaller agencies that are here locally based in Miami that no one has really even considered calling on because they don't think they have the clientele listing, but they're here and they do have them. So never think that an agency is too small to take on a big advertiser because they're not. They will and they do a good job at it because they give them that personal touch that they don't get with the larger agency. So always make connections with the folks that are leading at the client side because that will help you along the way. And if there's specific questions that you have or intel that you want to have, the client will know better than the agency at times. So just no keep good. that in mind. Good advice and never burn a bridge. And never burn a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the world is this small, <laughs> you know? Yes. But, so, but I was, I was gonna ask you in that respect, do you see, media buying units that are clients of use more like standalone companies like they become more like buying uh, entities or do you still see the traditional media department house within a full service agencies because I've seen you know from different people that I've talked to you you're seeing how media departments and buying units are evolving into being more like private, like uh, uh, separate entities from yeah. the agency world uh, because of the historical kind of, you know, mm -hmm. relationships, you know. Which is true. And that that is happening quite a bit. Um, we'll have a client that will have a buying service, which is what you're referring to where they're just buying the the space and then you have an agency that they're assigned to that has the creative the billing or you know all the other things that go along with the program and then you'll have another agency that's just there to do any driving check-ins and things like that so you do get a little bit of everything um but for the most part, we have agency-driven, uh, you know, companies that just have the one agency. But we do have those bigger clients that will say, okay, I need the buying service to be involved and I need, you know, our creative team to be separate. And it's layer after layer after layer. But um, don't ever feel intimidated by that. Um, the main person, it will be your buying service person and everything else will fall in place after that. So there's a lot of opportunity if you really dig in and build the partnerships and the relationships with everyone and just stay true. I mean, if, if there's something that is not working, I would highlight it, flag it, let somebody know so that that way everybody's on the same page. They will appreciate it. They do yeah, appreciate no. it. You know, part of uh, growing as a professional is is knowing how to navigate the waters, you know. And, and actually, I was having this conversation with a, a student recently uh, that, you know, it, she was asking me questions. And I said, you know, sometimes, it, like, one of the 
the things that I used to do when I was in sales, and I think if, if you're a smart, a smart salesperson or a smart, you know, a human professional, being. yeah, a professional working in a in a, a company environment is knowing how to do uh, internal diplomacy. Yes. You know, because your success is tied to so many people. Uh, within a corporation from billing to traffic depending on where you are to you know um creative yes um you know you you are the main liaison between the the agency or the advertiser and your company but to yeah. make that happen you know it takes a team it does. And, and you have to kind of be like, a, you know, kind of like a, the, the band leader of, yes. of moving parts. Yes. So, yes. so uh, I have just a couple more questions. Uh, so it, one, one of the things that kind of, you know, jumps out is the way that, that traffic or impressions is, is it, like you were explaining, is being counted. <laughs> um, it, 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 like for example, when you're driving around and you drive over those little cables and they make sure, <laughs> you know, they, 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 I would imagine that that's from the Department of Transportation, yeah. uh, kind of, uh, having a sense of how much traffic yes. goes through different locations within a different city. Areas. Is that data that, uh, for example, Clear Channel uses in order to calculate uh, daily traffic of different locations? That is part of um, the Traffic Audit Bureau, which is Geopath, same thing. When I say Traffic Audit Bureau is the same thing as Geopath, that's one of the main data that they send to us. Um, yes, that's very important because that gives us a sense of what kind of traffic is driving by each of these boards in any roadway. Um, yeah, you'll see those little cables and that's either they're planning on putting up a traffic light or a speed zone or anything of that nature. And we take advantage of that and we take that data as well. Um, so if you ever see those, um, yes, that takes your speed. So just know it knows how fast you're going. Yeah, <laughs> and no, how it, it camera and, you know, everything is <laughs> it, like a, like a Mario Kart game now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, so yes, all I, the monsters. Yeah. I remember a long time ago, someone mentioned that to me and I was like, oh my God, really? That's what that does? Because I had no idea. Um, but, you know, we can go as far back as when I started working for Clear Channel or Ackerley back in the days, we used to actually sit by the board with a little clicker and click how many cars would pass by just to get an average or a, a, some kind of sense of how many cars were passing by our boards. And we used to do that for a couple hours during you know, rush hour or later in the afternoon. And we were all assigned to do it at least once a week. And I was like, I'm not sitting next to the road doing this all day. But um, yeah, we had to do that. Um, so that's how far along we've come that we now, you know, we're a lot more improved in that and we, we don't do that anymore. And the same thing with creative. Um, back in the day, we used to paint uh, the boards. They were never printed or anything like that. We never imagined. We used to have artists in our warehouse. Um, I think it was a total of eight of them and they would come and paint the creative, whatever the creative was to be, and you had to give us creative 30 days prior to your start date. Mm -hmm. And we would number the plywood, and that's how our installers would put it out on the billboards, you know, one, two, three in order, and the creative magically appeared from an artist who actually hand painted them. So we've come a long way. We've evolved into just having a vinyl printed. Um, they're eco-friendly you know now they're lightweight they used to weigh i don't know how many pounds and now they are they're super lightweight um so our installers can 
uh, post them on time and quickly with no safety issues. Um, you know, things like that that have changed throughout the time have been incredible and incredible to witness and experience myself. I don't have to hear the stories, I can tell you myself. <laughs> so it's been great. It's been a, a nice journey. And yes, with the impressions, it's a little bit, um, you know, not so easy to explain, but if we were to build something as a sample for one of your classes, I'd be more than happy to build it out and show you specifically, okay, here's a demographic, here's how we came up with this impression, and we could use a sample advertiser and just build something out for you. No, that would be great um, so that I can uh, post it you know, along with your presentation, um, again, you know, part of the objective of the media planning class is to take them through all the media platforms and getting them to understand. And the interesting thing uh, is that a lot of these students go on to careers in media and they do become your client. I mean, I've been teaching for a long time, so now my my first um my some of my first students are now media directors wow at class at, you know like different big agencies so you know how about for, for coming full circle <laughs> that's exciting that's exciting and rewarding i'm sure <laughs> it is no but this has been amazing and awesome and I, I, you know, rather than uh, giving students the literature to, to read about it, um, it's much uh, richer to hear it with somebody that's doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, this is your bread and butter. You've been doing it for a, time, for a long time. And uh, when I thought about somebody to deliver, you know, this material, it has to be Yvonne. She's beautiful, <laughs> she's articulate, and she's a pro. <laughs> so, and she's my friend. Thank so, you so much. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for your time and for putting together a beautiful presentation. And by the way, the backdrop that you have <laughs> is, uh, you know, super. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Christelle. Thank you.